The city of Flint is no stranger to trouble, and its people have been through everything from extreme poverty to being labeled the most dangerous city in America. However, Flint's latest crisis, the water emergency, may be the worst of all. It's a problem that needs to be dealt with now, and will have effects that will last a lifetime. I could hardly sleep knowing that our youngest and most vulnerable children could be at greater risk if precautionary steps were not taken. This is irreversible damage, permanent damage. Now, before we look towards the future, we need to see how this all began. Flint, Michigan used to be synonymous with the American dream. It was an old-fashioned boom town where the money was flowing and industry was booming. Just like the gold rush of the 1800s, people from the East Coast, West Coast, wherever you could think of, were flocking to Flint for work. General Motors opened up its doors in 1908 and since then had built the city up as a mid-Michigan kingdom. From 1900 to 1960, nearly 183,000 people had found a place to call home in Flint. It was only a matter of time before the decline began. And when it did, it hit the city in its roots. It crippled the city so bad, in fact, that less than 8,000 workers of the once 80,000 deep workforce remains to this day. With less people working and living in Flint, the financial problems were bound to strike the people. Since 2002, the city has been under the burden of nearly $30 million in debt. To alleviate the weight of so much owed money, the first emergency financial manager was appointed in the city of Flint. Alicia Paxton has the story. The original emergency manager law was passed in 1988, created to help cities in financial distress. It allows a single person to be assigned into a city and can take over all decisions made in hopes of getting communities out from under money problems. In 2012, Governor Snyder updated the law to make it even stronger. Emergency manager supersedes all elected officials, including mayors and city councils, and also can change or eliminate all negotiated contracts. When a community is assigned an emergency manager, all democracy can in effect be thrown out, and elected officials become powerless. There have been 13 cities in Michigan under the effects of this law, including Flint. Since 2002, Flint has had six different managers in command. On April 16th of 2013, Flint signed an agreement to join the KWA, the Cary Nandi Water Authority, a group that helps give cities more power over costs and their water. At the time, Flint had been paying the city of Detroit high amounts of money for their water, and it was decided that a switch was in need. With this agreement, KWA would build a pipeline from Lake Huron directly to Flint. A couple months later, emergency manager Darnell Early took control and made some decisions that started a chain of effects. After the choice to go with KWA, the DWSD agreement was on borrowed time. DWSD, the Detroit Water and Sewerage Department, is one of the largest water and sewer systems in the U.S. today, and they also have been the source of Flint's water for over 50 years. But that was soon to change with the decision to take a cheaper route for Flint's water source. The decision to switch to the KWA meant one day later it was time to terminate the long-term contract between Flint and DWSD. Knowing that the pipeline would not be done until 2016, way after the contract was finished, Flint knew they needed a temporary water source. It was decided in March of 2014 that they would be switching to Flint River for the meantime. Flint water customers noticed a switch within hours, from things like the new smell, discoloration, and even the taste. And through the summer, the new problems continued. On September 8, 2014, a boiling water advisory was issued to certain water customers in Flint after coliform bacteria had been discovered in regular water flowing through Flint's pipes. The bacteria itself isn't harmful, however, it is a pointer that contaminants could be within the water. This breakthrough had brought validation to the people of Flint's concerns. About a month later, on October 13th, the water system's biggest user, General Motors, stopped using the water to make cars. GM decided to cut ties with Flint water and bring in an outside source. If the water wasn't good enough to make cars, how could it be drinkable for humans? Soon after this is when the problems would be revealed. Water, a basic need for everyday life. We use it for drinking, cooking, cleaning, and bathing. With Michigan being the Great Lakes state, we take it for granted. But what if that basic necessity was taken away from you? Flint, a major city here in Michigan that is no stranger to struggle, is now having to fight for a natural resource. 
on an Arctic cold afternoon with wind chills reaching negative 20. Flint residents took to the streets in front of City Hall expressing their concerns demanding clean water. This protest is in direct response from a notice Flint customers received about the high levels of dangerous TTHM in their water. TTHM, also known as trihalomethanes, are formed as a byproduct when chlorine is used to disinfect water for drinking. We need something done and we need something done now. This water crisis is taking a toll on residents, including Jackie Pemberton, who is standing up for her granddaughter. I have a three-year-old granddaughter that we bathe her in Flint water. She breaks out in a rash. We bathe her in her grandmother's water out in Holly, no rash. To figure out how exactly we got into this mess, we sat down with Flint's mayor, Dane Wally. Could you walk us through a little bit about how we got to this point? The city of Detroit, who we had been a, a customer of for uh, over 40 years, they terminated our contract. And we had a 12-month window to uh, find an, a new source or to negotiate a new uh, higher cost, short-term contract with the Detroit system. Uh, that's what the county did. Uh, they're paying uh, quite a good premium for that uh, short-term supply. The emergency manager here at the city of Flint made a different decision. And that decision, getting water from their own backyards, the Flint River. We got off the Detroit water and we're now getting the water from the Flint River. Right. Why can't we go back to the Detroit water until the pipeline's built? Well, that, that would be an option. I mean, it's technically possible. Uh, the pipes are still connected. So what do residents do in the meantime that refuse to drink the water? According to the city and mayor, they are okay to keep drinking it. So the city has given the residents the okay to drink the water, and you and your family drink the water, is that right? We do, yep. Um, we've uh, used it throughout. Again, I, I was not aware of the... Um, the high levels of TTHM. Neither were residents, and that's why they are demanding answers. Answer the question! Answer the question! Residents are also concerned about the decisions being made without them, including water rates. I'm concerned about the quality and affordability of our water. Um, you know, we're under an emergency manager situation, so this decision to move to the Flint River uh, was basically made in Lansing with no input from Flint residents and uh, we really don't have recourse uh, in our local government. I've advocated for increasing the public information and transparency because I think customers have a right to know. Uh, I've stepped up and asked the governor to make funding available so we can improve the treatment and fix the, the water system and do that without putting the rates on our, our local customers. Um, so I'm going to continue to, to work with the emergency manager, but I'm also going to advocate for the changes that I think we need. This letter in my hand is what pushed Flint families to the brink. To most, it felt like a slap in the face. On February 2nd, letters like this were delivered to mailboxes all across Flint. In the letter, the city acknowledged the suffering and discontent from its customers and assured them they were working hard to bring closure. Yet, that didn't matter for men and women having to continue to pay absurd water bills and buying packs and packs of bottled water for their families, since their very own water was undrinkable. Soon after they shipped letters out, leaders from the city made the decision to bring in a third party to drain their water issues. On February 10th, a team of water experts from Viola, North America, were brought in to conduct tests on the chemical riddled water. February 18th, just over a week after Veolia had been brought in, had discovered discoloration and issues with sediment. However, overall, the water was safe to drink, according to the company. The city had reduced its TTHM levels and had officially been found in compliance with federal levels. Veolia submitted their final recommendation and official results on March 18, 2015. The firm called for $3 million to be put into the water plant. Within this chunk of change would be changing the water filter system, further training for city staff, and other things regarding chemicals being used. A couple months later, on an August afternoon, Flint Judge Archie Heyman ordered water rates be cut after a 2007 sewage overflow incident in which the city moved $15 million from sewage funds to help pay for a lawsuit. Why is this related? For some families of Flint, their water bills started to decline after months of sky-high prices of poisonous H2O. That is, until September rolled around. 
it's bad, okay? And it affects them and the, the next generation to come. The DTHM problem was only the tender to a roaring fire that the next issue ignited. After nearly a year-long struggle for the people of Flint, a new problem blindsided them, and they were thrown deeper into chaos. Less than three weeks after Flint's water was declared safe and in compliance with the Safe Water Act, news leaked that researchers at Virginia Tech University had found traces of lead within Flint's water. An official press conference held on September 15th confirmed these tests at a local Flint church. The water found in some homes was three times the federal limit of lead within water. Aged lead pipes and lead soldering found in pipes are common throughout the city. Not only in city lines, but also in people's homes, and has been for years. But why is the lead a problem now? It's the corrosive Flint River that released the lead into the water. If your house has lead pipes, if your house has copper pipes with lead solder, then there's the potential, because of the corrosivity of the water, for some of that lead to leach into the water. On September 24th, a press conference was held at Hurley to show blood test results. The percentage of children with elevated blood lead levels has increased. Um, the most striking increase um, is in the zip codes with the highest water lead levels. Lead is not something meant for the human body. It's a neurotoxin that is especially dangerous to infants and young children, as it can permanently cause brain damage and can stunt growth. It's an emergency. There is the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, they routinely say there is no safe level of leads. Um, and when we saw an increase in lead levels, and then when the state um, saw that they also noticed an increase in lead levels, it's an emergency. You have to do something about it. A public health emergency was declared by the Genesee County Health Department on October 2nd because it had gotten to such a horrible point. The same day, the Flint Water Action Plan was released by state and city officials as an attempt to provide solutions. While the water emergency was officially declared by the county for families and especially children across Flint, the emergency started a long time ago. Jillian Berger and Haley Thompson tell us more. Nothing, nothing, nothing. A kid with lead poisoning presents with nothing. We have to scream. We have to check. There are no real signs of lead poisoning, but as time goes by and the children of Flint get older, the exposed kids can get anemia, have slowed bone growth, loss of their developmental skills, and many other terrifying repercussions. Lead, it is the most damning thing you can do to a kid. Um, it affects their entire life course trajectory. It lowers their IQ. It creates behavior problems. It decreases their lifetime earnings. It's, it's bad. Not knowing if your child has ingested or how much lead is scary, but there is a simple way to get them tested. So if a parent is concerned and they live in the city of Flint, go to your doctor. Check, you know, ask to get the blood lead level checked. Infants are at an even higher risk because they aren't screened until a specific age. The number of kids affected could be much larger than anyone realizes, and that means that many more kids who are screened after their levels have dropped will be affected by this water. These results underestimate the potential risk. We do not screen infants for lead. Months had passed from when the lead was first discovered to when it became an issue, and homes are not the only places that have been affected. Through this time span, 5,400 kids have been using and drinking this lead poisoned water while they're at school. Then we also do a lot of work with um, smaller children in Flint, my husband and I through our church, and when I look at their faces every week, a lot of them are already struggling with learning disabilities and then to heap lead on top of them, it's just a very sad thing. Eisenhower and Freeman Elementary, as well as Brownwell STEM Academies, were the schools with the most elevated levels in the Flint area. They are located in the zip codes with the highest water lead levels in Flint. Freeman Elementary had tested over six times the federal limit. After these findings, the state called an emergency for students to get their blood tested. We noticed uh, even more striking results there. Before the switch, the percentage of kids with elevated blood levels was 2.5%, and after the switch, it was 6.3%. Well, the realization of increased lead exposure and a rise in the number of children with elevated blood lead levels uh, was devastating for our community. These results shocked the public and sparked the government's plan of action. I could hardly sleep knowing that our youngest and most vulnerable children could be at greater risk. Our utmost priority at the State of Michigan, at the Department of Health and Human Services, is to prevent lead poisoning in children, and we are going down that path today. Home. It's the place you feel safest at, no matter what happens. But for people living in Flint, this is no longer the case. Seda Brandt and her two-year-old daughter Vanna know this all too well. It makes me kind of scared because you're supposed to be able to trust the water that you drink, but I don't know, the state let us down. Like many other concerned parents, she got her daughter tested soon after the lead announcement was made. 
She's fine. We haven't been drinking the water at all since August of last year. For a young child, routine is everything, and the water crisis has forced them to change theirs. We don't brush our teeth at the bathroom sink. We brush them at the kitchen sink because that's where our filter is. Not only does she have to worry about this change in their schedule, she now has to worry about their new financial burden that has been imposed on them to try to manage this problem. Well, I have to pay for my water now, and the cooler costs me, I don't know, 80 bucks, and it costs me like $8 every time to fill it up, and we drink water all the time. Just like many others in Flint, Seda feels that even after the switchback, the water will still be contaminated. Well, the only way that's going to get fixed is if they fix the pipes at this point, because they've already corroded the pipes away so badly that there's lead going to be in our water regardless. For now, Seda and the rest of Flint remain on a daily search for clean water. For many of these families, finding alternate sources of water is difficult with a tight budget and an empty wallet. Thankfully, charities have filled that gap. Without them, thousands would still be without clean water or resources to get them drinkable water. Alex Wendell and Bailey Talaska have this story. While the people of Flint were struggling with the lead problem, many charities and individuals came together to help out. Uh, we know that Flint needs a sustainable and secure uh, water supply for today and into the future, and this is what we are absolutely committed to. Many Flint locals have been dealing with this problem for a long time and desperately needed the relief. So my children and I have been drinking bottled water for probably over a year now, but I'm happy that everybody is now on the same page as far as the health concern of the citizens of Flint, especially our children. Bendel Beecher and even Davison donated to the cause. But not only did Flint's neighbors donate, there was also a flood of donations statewide. A couple of folks from the Birch Run area, for example, drive down and bring water, uh, even though they're not associated with the school system or the Flint communities. Companies like Zero Water, Sam's, United Way, and more reached out to donate water filters, bottled water, and money for Flint community schools. The Genesee Valley Mall hosted a water drive and received over 100,000 bottles of water. We've had individual uh, citizens come up with three and four cases of water in their trunks. Uh, we've had businesses come with pickup trucks and 40 cases. Um, a lot of the vendors that we work with here at the shopping center are, are donating. Um, of course, we're donating as well. And at the U of M Flint campus, United Way and their partnering organizations gave away 4,000 water filters to low-income families. Marching Ant Moving donated over 300 cases of water and helped transport it all. So far, hundreds of thousands of bottles of water have been donated, and the numbers are climbing so much that the schools aren't even counting anymore. With all the problems that people of Flint have come to deal with, some still choose to stay positive. There are constantly always new resources that are out there that are looking to help. So in the midst of a lot of trouble, there are also a lot of answers. But even with these hefty donations, some locals are not very happy about the dent this crisis has left in their wallets. I don't think that we need to be paying as much as we pay for it for our kids to get lead poisoning and chlorine and diarrhea from it and everything else. As important as charities are, it just doesn't fix the problem. And people have been taking to the streets to voice their adversity since the beginning. The biggest issue of this whole emergency is that no one seemed to be listening. Jordan Bruns tells us why. Flint Lives Matter! The people of Flint have had enough. Many have been campaigning since the initial switch from Detroit Water. Literally, I could tell the day that the switchover hit my pipes because the moment that I took a shower, it would switch about every two days. One day, it would smell like straight river water, and the very next day, it would smell like you were swimming in a swimming pool. Well, the day we went on to Flint City Water, I was like, nobody drink this water at all. I researched it, and we started using bottled water immediately. No more lies! No more lies! The people of Flint, much like you and I, depend on the basic need of water many of whom have gone with undrinkable water since the switchover. This is from my faucet um, over by the Fenton and Atherton area. This is actually lead, lead laden. I had it tested and it come back positive or lead. So that's what this is. If I let it sit here, all the particles will sit and float at the bottom and it'll all just sink. As bad as the water may be, people are most worried about how it's affecting their children. They're leaving us no option but to use this. This is our option. These are our children's option, and that's why I'm here, because no child should have to drink this. What's worse is that the people of Flint are having to pay more for water they can't use. Our water prices have skyrocketed. We spend approximately 80 to $90 a month on bottled water. If you live in Flint, you're not a wealthy person. That's why you're living there. 
And then to find out there was lead, I mean, we were still making ice cubes from it, and I feel really guilty that my kids have been exposed to lead for about 18 months now. For some, the actions that the government has taken are just not enough. That infrastructure is still there. The problem is still there. Part of the solution is because we can't keep putting bad water in there and think we're going to get good results. So we got to get good water. That's the first thing. But we got to fix the infrastructure. We got to fix the pipe. And we got to fix the damage that has been done to the citizens of Flint, Michigan. Been, I drank it for a while, unfortunately. You know, I, when, when, the, when the state said that the TTHM level was under control, I believed him. You know, and uh, thank God I never let my child uh, drink the water. I used bottled water for the last 10 weeks. But a lot of other people took them at their word. And, you know, that's just not acceptable. The outcry of the people lasted for months. They were waiting for someone to listen. After countless hours, days, and weeks of protests, the people spending day and night in the hot and cold to fight back finally won a small victory. For 174 days, the community waited desperately for government officials to switch back to the Detroit water system. Although the initial switch to Flint's water source was a cheaper option, the health risk that came was an expense that Flint could not afford. This was a crisis that should have never happened in the first place. Finally, on October 16th, Dane Wally announced the final action to switch back to the source they should have never left. But the switch wasn't free. $12 million was needed with the joint efforts of the state giving $6 million, Flint City Government giving $2 million, and the Mount Foundation giving $4 million, and efforts to bring safe drinking water back to Flint. But is the switch back enough to fix the problems that it caused? I think the health, the health portion of it fell short. I mean, so short that it's not even on the same playing field. Testing of our young people and our kids is very important. And I think they need to have an aggressive plan to get into schools and test kids for lead exposure. Until they do that, uh, all of this, all of the switching or whatever they do is going to fall short if, if lives are impacted by poor health quality as it related to the water and the lead issue. Absolutely not. They're not doing enough. No. Having a corrosion control plan to begin with before you switched over the water, that would have been doing enough. You know, having any kind of a plan. We're the, we're the only city in the United States that doesn't have a co corrosion control plan for some of the most corrosive water that you could get in this area. It's ridiculous. No, they're not doing enough. No, absolutely not. Finally, after months of struggle, the dominoes began to fall and someone had taken the blame. On October 19th, DEQ Director Dan Wyant reassigned Lyanne Schechter-Smith, the chief of the DEQ's drinking water office. The Michigan DEQ had been using the wrong standards for the water going through the system. Instead of treating the water for a city of 100,000, the size of Flint, the levels were set for only a city of 50,000, which left out crucial corrosion controls that would have stopped the lead found in old pipes from leaching into the drinking water. On October 19th, Howard Croft resigned as the director of the Flint Department of Public Works. He was the chief staff member overseeing the Flint Water Project. Then the issue became national. At the urging of state politicians, the U.S. EPA started involvement November 10th, as they announced they'll be conducting a full review on the crisis. The results will not be complete until the fall of next year. Following a few days later, November 13th, families in Flint finally fought back. The first lawsuit was filed against Governor Snyder and the chiefs of staff for the health problems caused by the emergency. And now we look towards what is in store for the future of Flint. Jordan Hancock tells us more. For the time being, the future of Flint's water plan is a coin toss. At this moment, what may or may not come before us is incredibly bleak. No one can agree on where this all started or who's responsible. Was it the local government's fault? The DEQ's fault? The state government? Or is it the Last federal government? Who's at fault? No one was asked. The citizens weren't asked. The, the, the council wasn't asked. Was this a good decision? And almost immediately, Boil water advisories, TTHMs, and then the cream to cream, lead everybody. Lead will linger for the foreseeable future. The effects, the threat. It'll all be there even after we believe we've solved all of Flint's water problems. And I asked, you know, Flint City officials, everybody who had a hand involved, is that what you want for your children or your grandchildren? Because that's what it comes down to. This is what we're leaving, our legacy for, for the children. Children with lead poisoning won't be helped until after their blood tests are examined, and by then the stages of their illness may already be severe. Even a short exposure to lead can lead to irreversible, permanent damage. 
You know, we tell them to wear their helmet because we don't want them to get in our ICU upstairs with a head injury because we want Flight Kids to grow up to be amazing. We don't want any additional barriers in their way. And this is just a potential additional barrier to their lifelong achievement. And the children of Flint have enough to worry about already. The people have spoken up and taken action. They filed a class action lawsuit. A class action lawsuit could Thank mean serious legal Rogers trouble for everyone involved, uh, and it will prolong the effects of this disastrous Filters event. Are the fix. Filters are the fix. Everything that's been done before now hasn't solved the problem. Flint is left with only one option. I, Karen W. Weaver, mayor of the city of Flint, declare a state of emergency in the city of Flint. This was effective December 14th, 2015. We need state and federal assistance for the people to feel comfortable. We need some help. After all this time has passed and all these events have taken place, the water is still poison to the Flint community. The lead remains, the threat still looms, the fear lingers. The water is still undrinkable. With no resolution in sight, it's not quite certain just how long this crisis will continue. A new administration could tighten things down in the vehicle city, but for the time being, Flint is still in the midst of a problem that will define themselves for years maybe even decades to come.